big disadvantage clearly of hydrogen versus gas and natural gas is is the cost component and this this needs to be tackled i think a lot of it will be in the end driven how daring in the parentheses the the politicians are and how much they really want to push it but if if they see it really as a as a cost effective solution to the decarbonization problem they are facing hydrogen for sure has a bright future ahead Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to the latest episode of Energy Unplugged. I'm Richard Howard, the Research Director at Aurora Energy Research, and today I'm joined by Thomas Furder, who's Managing Director at Barclays Investment Bank. In this episode of the podcast, we'll be discussing the potential for hydrogen. Is it hype, or are we about to see a huge surge in interest and projects in this space? Um, This is a topic that Aurora has been watching for the last couple of years, and it's fair to say that we've seen ourselves a huge surge in interest, um, both from governments talking about this and and also from industry and from our clients that we talk to on a regular basis who want to know more and more about this topic of hydrogen. So I suppose it's interesting to think, why is that? Why have we seen such this surge in interest? There's been a lot said in recent months about the huge potential for hydrogen um, particularly in uh, in attacking hard to abate sectors such as industry, aviation, heavy transport, and heating. And for me, um, what has made a big difference in the last 12 months or so is the discussion of net zero. Before we were talking about net zero, we had an 80% target for greenhouse gas reduction in the UK. And it's fair to say lots of industries could hide behind that 20% and think that they were part of that 20%. But now that we're talking about net zero in the UK and in Europe, um, it's there's nowhere to hide anymore. And that means that other sectors, um, harder to abate sectors, have had to think very seriously about how to get to zero emissions. And to me, that's where um, a technology such as hydrogen that has potential to abate those sectors suddenly becomes of huge interest. Um, so we've been following this in Aurora. Um, We have done a couple of very large multi-client studies, one looking at GB and one looking at Germany and the Netherlands, uh, where we've modelled the hydrogen uh, market future development um, and looked at the potential and come to the conclusion that in the long term, with um, a lot of support from government and focus from industry, this could be a very large um, part of our overall energy system. In recent months, we've also seen lots of movement on the government side, with the European Commission publishing its hydrogen strategy with national strategies now in place in the Netherlands, Germany, Spain, Portugal, and most recently France. We've also seen specific policies come forward, such as the SDE++ scheme in the Netherlands, when in a sense, the rubber might hit the road uh, with developers being asked to uh, state the price that they require in order to bring forward hydrogen products. So it does seem um, that we're on the cusp potentially of um, lots of uh, projects coming forward in this space. Just before I bring in Thomas, I think it's useful just to set out a few pieces of terminology that we'll probably use many times during this conversation, particularly helpful for those who are less familiar with hydrogen production technologies. Firstly, we'll talk about grey hydrogen. This is uh, the type of hydrogen that is used predominantly today and is made um, from methane using a process of steam reforming Um, where the CO2 and hydrogen are split and the CO2 is not captured, so still contributes to global warming. We'll also talk about blue hydrogen, which uh, uses the same splitting process, but the CO2 is then captured, thus significantly reducing uh, the CO2 emissions and contribution to global warming of this hydrogen. Finally, we'll talk about green hydrogen, Um, also sometimes referred to as electrolytic hydrogen. This is where, through an electrolyzer, electricity is used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And this is commonly regarded to be the least carbon-intensive form of hydrogen. So, Thomas, just to kick things off, I'd be interested in your views 
in the overall scale of the market potential and role of hydrogen? I know this is something you've done a lot of research on at Barclays, but do you think this is going to be a big market or is it just uh, hype? Thanks, Richard, for, for the invitation. And uh, yes, it's, it's a very interesting question. And if you believe in the equity research reports that uh, my research colleagues published in May, is that we can look into a, a $1 trillion global market, $1 trillion global market by 2050 in the, in the hydrogen space with about 900 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity uh, to be installed. We currently have three gigawatts uh, in, in manufacturing, so a really a, a huge upscaling needed and investments uh, over the next 30 years just in this electrolyzer capacity of about $500 uh, billion. So if it turns out to be really not a hype, but something real, it could be really, really huge. I, in my view, what's still the open question is how large a role it could play and uh, as uh, how uh, Richard you, you were referring to a, a couple of studies that that you've done I also participated in your study in Germany and uh, uh, and covered Germany the Netherlands and Belgium and you clearly see two scenarios there and um, how how decarbonization can be done can it be done just with electrification or can it be done in a in a, in a more efficient way by using also green gases and hydrogen would be the most prominent of those green gases. Um, we've also seen other research reports that, that I've looked into earlier this year and, and late last year that really talk about massive differences in the, in the capex required if you, if you go in a full electrification mode as you have to really overbuild your system um, significantly in order to allow for the for the uh, low uh, heat uh, low low temperature days in in January when there's no heat and, and no wind um, or you use a smarter system but I think that part of the question would also be uh, what are politicians ultimately aiming for because you can clearly decarbonize by uh, going the easy solution by just uh, moving the pro problem somewhere else. Um, we, we have done that partially also on the industrial side over the last decade or two. Um, and and the big question for me is in particular in the early phase is how much political support is there to really allow the industry to decarbonize because ultimately if we don't decarbonize it here in, in Europe, it will move somewhere else. and. Uh, whether this is really then the right strategy, a political strategy uh, remains to be seen. So yes, Absolutely. I, I see, I see a, a lot of, of potential there, but also a lot of things to do on the political side in order to make it work. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right to highlight the role of industry there. And, and then in a sense, I think you're alluding to some competitiveness concerns. I had uh, Professor Dieter Helm on the podcast recently as well, and we were talking about um, some of the issues with measuring um, carbon emissions on a production basis rather than really thinking about our carbon footprint and, and the risk that creates in terms of carbon leakage, which I think really relates to what you're saying. Just, just thinking about then, you talked about some a very big number there of uh, potential market size of $1 trillion by um, 2050. That, that aligns with um, some numbers we have from Aurora of uh, the, 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 the market size for selling the hydrogen gas in Europe alone could be uh, up to 150 billion euros uh, per annum by 2050. So I think we're talking about similar order of magnitude. Um, what, what do you think will be the, the main determinants of the scale of this, um, this industry in the medium to long term? So where do you see hydrogen being used um, and where are the, the applications that you think w will come through or, or won't come through? We'll, we'll return in a moment to talk about the, the short term, but I'm thinking now just about the sort of medium to long term. Yeah, for me, and, and this is also, I think, way, uh, way prominently highlighted in the research your colleagues have done on, on the German markets is it's three factors. Uh, the first fact that everybody's talking about it, you really have to uh, get it going in the industry. The first step is replacing yeah. gray hydrogen with, with blue or, or green hydrogen. The second step is to really work on those hard to abate industries uh, to, uh, to allow them to decarbonize. Uh, 
the alternative in, in my view is just the deindustrialization which which might not be the the uh, aim of of the politicians the second topic is is an interesting one where there's a lot of focus currently is the uh, transport sector where clearly you have hydrogen as a solution to um, long distance um, transport of heavy goods and this could be on the road this could be on ships this could be on on airplanes and i just recently saw a study by airbus uh, that they're promoting now hydrogen uh, uh, planes that uh, that they want to build um, but what i really it, it hydrogen has a has a role there will also very much depend on how you incentivize the build out there absolutely uh, uh, and the third one is really the heating sector, where currently I don't really see, at least in, in the continent, uh, uh, lots of debates at all, where the delta could be huge. I mean, you, you just think about how to how to use uh, hydrogen in the existing uh, the gas distribution networks, and, and you can think about the magnitude where, where hydrogen could play. A uh, big disadvantage, clearly, of hydrogen versus gas and natural gas is is the cost component and this this needs to be tackled uh, coming back to the initial comment i think a lot of it will be in the end driven how daring the parentheses the the politicians are and how much they really want to push it but if if they see it really as a as a cost effective solution to the decarbonization problem they are facing hydrogen for sure is is has a bright future ahead yeah, absolutely. I want to focus on kind of a bit more on the short term. And um, I suppose for a lot of people looking at this space, that the real question they're asking themselves is, what is the value proposition? Where where are the investment opportunities, either right now or in the next sort of two, three years that the p- people will be thinking um, to develop? Do, do you see any investable opportunities in in that time horizon? That's really a big question. That also any any conversation I have with potential investors, uh, the, the first question I get asked is to where can we invest now? And in my view, this will heavily dependent on how really the, the next steps are taken by those countries that have set out the agenda, the roadmap for hydrogen, but still need to go into the specifics. Uh, you mentioned that the Netherlands is now going ahead in November with the first tender. Let's see what comes out there. But uh, in, in my view, you you have to see really the investable support regime uh, up and running in order to uh, attract ultimately then, then the money. And if you think about where this could be, in, in my view, the easiest one is to replace gray hydrogen with blue or green hydrogen. Yeah. And if the right support regime is in place, and the Netherlands goes uh, goes goes in that way, and, and I also understand that Portugal and, and UK are, are thinking, Germany is also thinking in that way. Uh, the first really bigger investment opportunities for investors, I would see, is investors teaming up with industrial partners that actually have a need to replace the grey with green hydrogen, or to transform like the steel industry parts of their production processes to hydrogen and sourced and green hydrogen from newly built um, uh, electrolyzers or, or reformers that are ultimately then financed by investors. Uh, on, on that opportunity of, of moving current users of grey hydrogen to blue or green, that seems to be something that could be solved either with demand side policy or supply side policy. So in a sense, we know that, or from our own analysis, that the green hydrogen is more expensive than grey hydrogen at the moment and so in a way those industrial users don't have an incentive to switch um, switch sources um, and governments could achieve that with incentives either through carbon pricing on the end user or through uh, sort of support for the for the generation of lower carbon hydrogen whether it's blue or green it seems that there's two two different approaches they, they could go in hand in hand or or separately in, in my view, in, initially, there has to be a, a closed system approach because you would not have a market that is integrated and functioning for some time. An integrated market needs connectivity, needs the infrastructure to, to transport the hydrogen from one hub to another in place. And this will take some time to build out. I mean, there are plans on the continent to have the backbone on the hydrogen 
the first phase by 2025, uh, second phase by 2030, and th 2035 really have a full European-wide backbone on hydrogen. But that would still be 15 years uh, to, to go. I don't think we can wait 15 years if we want to meet those, those targets. So the initial approach, in my view, has to be some sort of closed system support regime where you are supporting an industrial client and the industrial client uses that support regime to pay somebody to provide him with with the hydrogen um, a, a big question also will be how the definition how the specification of the green hydrogen or the, the low carbon hydrogen is in the end uh, specified because yeah. Uh, we we have a, a lot of talk about hydrogen, but it doesn't really help if you continue to produce grey hydrogen. It it won't really help you in in the in this carbon uh, uh, balance. Yeah, I think you focus on a really important point there. It seems to me that some sort of certification and potentially some trading scheme or obligation around this will be necessary to really identify what what is going on in this market. So. What we've seen from some of our recent analysis is sort of counterintuitively, um, green electrolyzer hydrogen is is actually very um, can be very carbon intense um, if the power system itself is is carbon intense as well. So taking Germany as the example, we have a a, a system with a lot of coal uh, still in the system, um, and our calculations show that uh, green hydrogen would be very um, carbon intense at, at the moment and not actually be uh, any better than um, than blue and grey hydrogen and, uh, until much further down the track. So we do need to be a little bit cautious um, about this, I think, but definitely um, a key policy for governments in my mind will be to make sure we get the labelling right so people know what they're, what they're consuming and their carbon emissions um, and then design the incentive structures around that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think once that's done is then also the tenders that will come out and whether the tenders then ask for a decarbonization of certain industrial processes or for the production of green hydrogen, on the other hand, with the help of some sort of feed-in tariff system or, or similar arrangements, uh, you will see also that the, the market gets gets established as you have then a clear rule framework around this market coupled with the infrastructure build out that should come over the next five to 10 years. In, if, if you come back, uh, or if we come back to, to the investment opportunities, um, so initially I think this closed system approach could be, could be the, the one that's, that's most promising and, and easiest to implement. Um, we have then identified as a second step, five pillars where you could invest as a, infrastructure investor as an investor that's interested in this hydrogen opportunity. And those five pillars very quickly are on the production side, i.e. you are then the specialists and the electrolyzers and the reformers to produce hydrogen to the specifications that should then be specified in the new framework. The second, and, and part of that production also has to include a lot of renewable build out. I mean, we haven't really spoken about that. But in addition to all the money that needs to go into the electrolyzers and making the system on the hydrogen work, we also need to have another massive build out of renewables just to support them, the electrolyzers uh, with Indeed. green hydrogen, uh, with green energy. Um, so that's the first pillar, production. The second pillar would be the industrial customers. And some of them, it's easy because they just replace gray with green or blue. For some, they really have to change the processes like the steel industry, cement industry. So they really have to invest into new processes and it could well be done with partners on, on the investor side uh, to, to, to help them to do that. The third pillar in our view is on the transport side. And on the transport side, we are seeing actually two opportunities. The first one is a lot of talk on the EU, on the German level is to get long haul truck traffic onto hydrogen. It requires an infrastructure build out of filling stations and those filling stations initially won't be used much. So you yeah. really need to have a framework in place, but with the right framework, I think there are investors that are happy to build that and, and put that in place. And the second one is, is quite an interesting one where you can decarbonize really the local uh, public service, uh, or the, the public uh, uh, transportation uh, provision. And this could be, 
converting the city bus systems into hydrogen systems with a, a whole economy around it with the hydrogen bus, with the fitting station networks, with the electrolyzers. Yeah. Um, you, you see it also already on some trains where you have train lines in Spain, in the Netherlands, um, in, in France that are currently run by diesel and they're converted into hydrogen uh, trains because electrification doesn't make much sense. But you also, again, need on one end and the other end, you need some electrolyzers to produce you or, or, or reformers to produce the hydrogen that you need. And, uh, and ultimately, that brings us then to the fourth pillar, which is the infrastructure that needs to be in place at some point when you really want to have a functioning market to support the transport of hydrogen from hub to hub. But also, more importantly, it doesn't really help you to produce hydrogen when the power price is low if you don't really have a storage in between because the customer will most likely need the hydrogen at another time when you produce it. So the storage part of, of, of the system is, is also very important in that infrastructure build out. And then last but not least, in my view, it's, it's the whole heating system sector that's currently not really talked about. I think in the UK a little bit more because we have already some pilot uh, schemes uh, that, that are contemplated both in Scotland and, and in England. Uh, but on the heating side, this could be really a game changer. If hydrogen on the end is a replacement for gas, it could be really a, a big, a big boost on the demand side. One other one which I hear a lot of people talking about is ammonia, which I suppose connects with all of this. Um, I, I suppose the two, two main things that I hear talked about, one, um, use of ammonia um, directly, um, so produced from green hydrogen, upgrading into ammonia, and then used directly as either as a feed source in in uh, chemical industry or as a fuel directly, um, and then secondly, ammonia um, as a as a longer term form of energy storage. Are you optimistic about this opportunity as well, or do you think that one is a, a bit further away? Ammonia, I think, comes in when you think about do I have enough production capacity where I need hydrogen. And currently we don't have that, but we will build it out. At some point there comes a point when you are just using all your renewable build out capacity to produce hydrogen and you need to import it. And currently it's very, very costly to import hydrogen. So it doesn't really make sense to import hydrogen, say from North Africa or from, from the Middle East. However, if you find a medium that's easier to transport than liquid hydrogen, which is very, very costly to transport, uh, then you could solve some of those issues. And, and I think there is a place for ammonia, in particular if you think about where hydrogen could be used in the transport side. I, I hear about projects on the maritime side, but also ultimately why would it make sense to produce hydrogen for fertilizers, for example, here in Europe, when you can produce it much cheaper somewhere else and the transportation costs of that product, even if you transport it then from there, say the Middle East to, to, to continental Europe, won't be that high. So it, it's, it's much more effective than, than using valuable hydrogen production facilities for, for that type of, of, uh, of chemical processes. So I see, I see a future of ammonia, but to be honest, I think the, the, the development and, and the research in, into it um, has to step up still. Uh, also, there's a lot of talk about liquid carriers of hydrogen and whether they could solve the transportation issue, um, where we are still at the very, very beginning of, of the commercialization of that uh, applications. So, Thomas, we're coming towards the end of the, the podcast and, and we come to a, a sort of wrap up session, which we like to call overrated or underrated. I'm going to list out a few different topics um, and you have to tell me whether you think they're overrated or underrated as concepts. Um, the first one um, is fuel cell cars. Do you think they are um, underrated or overrated? I personally think it's overrated but I see a lot of opportunities for it in niche applications. Okay, and is that more in, in cars or in heavier duty? He heavier duty or, or very, yeah. very specific uh, logistical applications. 
Okay, so the second one, you mentioned a bit earlier in our conversation around some of the competitiveness concerns. Um, so if, in a sense, if we try and force industry to change its way and decarbonize in Europe, there's a risk that um, we might see the industry just relocate elsewhere um, in, in the world. And um, some people, um, the answer of, of how to overcome this, some people say is to impose border carbon adjustments. It's something that's been discussed in academia for a long time. And now the, the European Commission is talking a lot about this as well. But do you think that concept is overrated or underrated? I think it's overrated because it will be a nightmare to administer. But we have to get some sort of carbon adjustments, uh, border adjustments uh, going. Otherwise, we wouldn't really succeed with with the policies we're trying to drive in, in Europe. Yeah. And there's a risk that some of these industries we're trying to decarbonize will just simply go somewhere else. Finally, I suppose, and potentially most controversially, um, I see that a lot of the talk around hydrogen is around green hydrogen specifically. Um, it seems, uh, well, in the European Commission strategy itself, it focuses very much on green hydrogen um, with uh, blue playing a, a limited role. And similarly, in the German strategy, uh, very much along the same lines. Do you think that green hydrogen itself is overrated as a concept? Uh, I think it is, in particular, if you think about what can be done with green hydrogen for the next 5, 10, 15 years. It's just a, a small part or pile of a uh, pie of the of the equation we have to solve. And if you really want to decarbonize, we have to get the system going now and just relying on green hydrogen will not allow us to do that. So we have to get up the scale. We have to scale up and this can only be done in the short term with, with blue hydrogen, in my view. That doesn't mean we should not at the same time also try to push uh, green hydrogen, but it, it has to be a, a balanced approach. A mix of both. Yeah, and I sort of see a risk that some some folks just talk about the green side of this and um, and I, I fear that we won't see the scale if that's the approach we pursue. Very interesting. Well, it's been great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for um, sharing your views and, and so openly and particularly in identifying what you saw as those five pillars, the five investment opportunities. I think that's that was really useful and interesting um, to hear somebody who's, who's clearly studied this space in a lot of detail, actually pointing to some real life uh, ideas, concepts and, and investment opportunities that you are looking at. So thanks again um, for appearing on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Richard. That was Richard Howard, Aurora's research director, talking to Thomas Furrider, managing director of Barclays Investment Bank. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.